Good evening, everyone, and welcome to University of Westminster. Some of you are from University of Westminster. Some of you are visiting University of Westminster as journalists from South Asia, and I know some of you. And some of you are guests here. So welcome to our university for this particular event. This had been organized long time back, not that long time back, but a few weeks back, before Tibet came back in news for, let's say, problematic reasons. I'll, I'll come to that. Uh, as a way of introduction, we, I'm Professor Dibyesh Anand. My preferred pronouns, he and him. Uh, I'm head of School of Social Sciences, and I'm also a member of Center for the Study of Democracy. Our director, Dr. Natasha Kaul, who also works on the Himalayan region, could not be here, so she sends her regards to you. But within the center, we work on all kinds of issues related to democracy, rights, post-colonial world, emerging powers, and various other issues. But something which you're very clear about is the importance of engaging with communities we study. There are many universities where you get people studying, let's say, Tibet, or Tibetan culture, or Tibetan history. But there'll be reluctance to engage with Tibetan community. That's an example. It could be also with Kurdish people. So there'll be people who will be studying Kurdistan, Kurdish culture, but not engaging with Kurdish community. And that's a common theme in many universities. At our university, we're very clear that people and cultures that we study are, we are studying them not as subjects, but they're important to as partners. So we have often engaged with communities. And I can see quite a few Tibetans here. And you know the kind of things we have been doing in Tibet for many years. It's like many years, including hosting His Holiness Dalai Lama in 2012 since when I, I couldn't go back to China after that, but that's fine. We have hosted him, and I have no apology for that. And we do it without apology. We do it without any explanation. Because it's quite important that we open up the space for discussions, conversations, to talk about contentious issues, including issues of human rights, which should not be contentious, but also issues of freedom, which also should not be contentious. Contentious, right? But that's our university and our Center for the Study of Democracy. I would invite you to check us out on internet and other places and Twitter. But you're not here to listen to me. I'm not a speaker here. You'll listen to the speaker here, Tim Lawton, who's a member of parliament. And he doesn't know what I'm going to ask him because we, we have not discussed that. When we invited him, uh, he agreed. And that's a good thing, which is rare for politicians to do, isn't it? Just say yes. He didn't know me, by the way, right? We didn't know each other. He doesn't know what I will ask. He doesn't know what my politics is, what thing is. Because, and this is something I know about him over the years, that there are very few people in the UK who have been consistently committed on Tibet and Tibetan cause. When Tibet was not fashionable, when Tibet became fashionable, when Tibet was not fashionable again, you know, at various times. Very few people I can say with confidence who have been consistent. And Tim has been that person. I know, and there's one more person I can talk about anyway, Tim has been that person. So for me, therefore, when there was an opportunity to host Tim, I said yes, because we'd like to hear from him a bit about you, a bit about why you support Tibet, what does support mean to you, and why should we care? So let me start with welcoming you, but asking you, Tim, that why you're interested in Tibet. Right. Can you choose this? It's on. Okay. Here. Fine. Right. First thing I can do is because this is supposed to be a conversation, so I'm going to turn my yeah. chair like that, rather than sort of make a presentation, a speech. So, um, Dipesh, I'm really um, happy to be here. I've never been to Westminster University before. You've made it sound very scary because you didn't tell me what I'm actually in for and what, what we're going to ask. But as far as I'm concerned, we're amongst friends. It's good to see some familiar faces. And so I want to have a discussion. And I want to hear from uh, you what we should be doing. And I want to tell you what I think we are doing. So why on earth would me, a trained archaeologist, former banker from Sussex, be remotely interested in Tibet? Um, well, some very good friends of my family back in the 1970s adopted a Tibetan young man who'd fled from uh, Tibet and helped bring him up in, uh, in Sussex. And so I had an early exposure to where is this place, Tibet? And my own parents were then considering actually adopting some um, Tibetans. But in the end, there was too much of a handful of me and my siblings that it didn't, um, it didn't happen. So I got curious about Tibet. And it was the very first 
demonstration I ever went on as a spotty, I think a 15-year-old or whatever it was at the time, where I went with the Tibet Society and we demonstrated outside the uh, Chinese embassy about various, whatever the latest human rights abuses that the Chinese were waging uh, uh, against Tibetans um, then. So that's how I got interested in um, Tibet. Um, I've been to China once, probably would never go again because I'm sanctioned, so I'm not allowed to go to uh, China. Their loss, not mine. And um, I went over actually to Xinjiang. I went to Urumqi and to, uh, to Kashgar. And it was a very strange and a very scared place even in those, uh, those days. And I saw a different side of um, China. Wasn't allowed to go to um, Tibet. And then many years later, I became an MP back in 1997. And we had an all party uh, parliamentary group for Tibet. And it was one of the first groups that I joined. I've been an MP now for 26 years. So I've been very involved with it. And I became joint chairman of it, gosh, seven, eight years ago, what, um, whatever. So very involved. And why is it important? And Dipesh is right. We've had a lot of debates in Parliament over Tibet over the years. And quite often, it's been me, one other, and a dog. And there's not been a huge amount of interest in it. That has changed drastically over the last few years. And if there's one good thing that has come out of the genocide that the Chinese Communist government are waging in Xinjiang, it has been to raise the whole profile of what the Chinese government is capable of against people within and beyond the borders of, uh, of China. And surprise, surprise, what they're doing in Xinjiang is what they've been doing in Tibet since 1959. So Tibet was the, uh, was the testing ground uh, due to the General Secretary of the Communist Party now taking over in Xinjiang and uh, using the same sort of tactics, and now we're seeing it in Hong Kong and beyond. So all of a sudden, at last, the world has woken up to the fact that China is up to some very dark uh, and unjust um, practices, and we have overlooked that in Tibet for far too uh, long. And for me, the resilience and the fight and the spirit of the Tibetan people and what they stand for, having been privileged to have met His Holiness the Dalai Lama three times now, been to Dharamsala twice, met many Tibetans, met many monks who've been tortured and others. Um, I think they are symbolic of the interest and the flame of liberty that most decent people in this world stand for. Uh, and in supporting the Tibet Tibetan people, we support the rule of law, we support the rights of every human being to be able to live their lives as they, as they wish uh, without having it snuffed out and the sort of oppression that for the Chinese communist government is absolutely routine. It's become. So it's not just about Tibet and Tibetans, it, it's about liberty and freedom, democracy and following your values, your faith or whatever and the Tibetans have been in the front line of that struggle for almost 70 years, as we know. That was a very long answer. No, no, but the I microphone think almost gave out halfway through as well. No, no, but, uh, but uh, there's eight points I took from it, so I'll expand on that. Again, the reason I'm saying because, of course, some of you are Tibetan. For you, it's not new, but some of you, for it's a new thing, so I'll explain for you. So what I took from your story, of course, is the fact that which everyone has to remember, especially we are also recording it for the posture, is that we are talking not of people whose human rights are being abused only, we are talking of refugees. So we are talking of people who have been exiled. So you, when you said people, and no one leaves their country easily, no one wants to leave their country easily, it's about being refugee. So what we are dealing with, of course, is even for those of you who have heard of the Dalai Lama but don't know much, he's still a refugee. He's not a privileged citizen of any part of the world. And being a refugee brings its own precarity and vulnerability. And we can see that what's happening in India with the Tibetans now. But anyway, so you talked about the refugee part, you talked about the personal part where, and not only, I think for many people, the connection has been that personal. When they come across someone, they get attracted, then they get curious and they do something about it. But I have to say that very few people will do something about it. And you're one of the rare person who I think is constantly doing something about it. So for that, I think, the Tibetan community and for those of us who support Tibet should be thankful. Right? That's the important part. But 
please bear in mind we are talking of Tibetan refugees, so people who are refugees for many years. So Dalai Lama came into exile in 1959. He's still in exile. That's what we're talking of. Most Tibetans in India, Nepal, if you don't know in Nepal, most of them are out now. They've been thrown out of Nepal or have all the freedoms taken away. In case of India, which is supposedly the world's largest democracy, there's high restriction. Again, many of you may not know that India is not a signatory to Geneva Convention on Refugee, Refugees, which implies that they have given refuge to the, His Holiness and his followers. So imagine what happens once His Holiness is not around to his followers because they have no rights there. So we are talking people without any rights. Now, 97 when you became MP, 97 when you came to UK, by the way. And that's a period when, if I'm not mistaken, there was a lot of interest in Tibet, relatively. Hollywood was interested in Tibet, seven years in Tibet came, Kundun came, and again, for most of you who are very young, you'll not remember and not know about it, but there was a high point, I think. And then things went down, I'll come to that. But two or three other things you mentioned which is important for us to bear in mind. One is Xinjiang and Uyghurs. So what China has been doing to Tibetans is not unique in the sense that they're not only doing to Tibet, they've been doing Uyghur Muslims, that's in attention now. They've been doing to Hong Kong people, they're doing to Chinese people also, right? So that's, so we're not talking therefore for Tibetans being the only victim but the other victims, how to connect the struggles. But you ended by talking of how you were impressed by, or you know, you continue because of resilience of Tibetan people, the values. Now, I am not a Buddhist. I have no, well, very limited interest in Buddhism. I'm atheist. I identify as queer atheist, right? So it's like all kinds of things. I don't fit into any kind of Lama and Buddhist family. Doesn't matter. The reason is that doesn't matter because what I find with Tibetan movement, again, some of you may know, I work on other freedom movements also. What I find, of course, is the values part that this is not a struggle only for freedom for Tibetans. It's about holding on to basic value and challenging authoritarianism, right? So that's a broad thing I thought I'd expand because of course we have got people who may not know much about Tibet. But coming back to you and I'm going to ask you is that what pressures do you face or have you faced because of the position you take? Because I said maybe it's you and another member of parliament from very different party, I think, and then, well, wish a dog or cat, whatever, very few of you. So what pressures have you faced and how have you managed to stand up against it? Right. So the great thing about Tibet is there's real cross-party consensus in, uh, in Parliament. So I co-chair the Tibet group with Chris Law, who's uh, an SMP um, Braveheart lookalike. Um, we have Catherine West, who's the Labour Party Spokesman on Foreign Affairs is an officer and very um, supportive. Uh, we have um, uh, Vera Hophouse, who's a Lib Dem uh, MP, is one of our officers. So it's a subject which absolutely unites um, MPs across the parties, which is, which is rare and something we should seize on. So everybody recognizes the plight and the injustices that have been waged against the Tibetan um, people. So it's a uniting force in, in Parliament, which is great, so we should, we should build on, um, on that. Um, what have the challenges been? Well, two years ago I got uh, sanctioned along with four other Conservative MPs and two members of the House of Lords and um, a lawyer and uh, an academic from Newcastle um, University. Completely out of the blue, li literally, the first I knew about it, was I got a, um, a text message from Chris Law saying, why have you been sanctioned and I haven't? What have I done wrong? So I said, well, you're a lightweight. So, and he's been desperately trying to get sanctioned ever since, but he hasn't succeeded yet. Um, and none of us have actually been told um, the basis of our sanctioning. Apparently, there was a press conference in Beijing and that announced that we were a threat to national security or whatever and have been uh, spreading falsifications about the uh, Chinese people or whatever. Um, and we are not allowed or our close uh, family to travel to China. All our assets in China have been uh, seized. Well, none of us have any. Uh, we can't do any uh, business with China. Didn't want to. Um, and that's that. Um, but we've never actually even received a, dear Mr. Lawton, your ban from coming to China um, letter from the Chinese um, government. So I don't actually know what it involves. My daughter is very 
uh, cross with me because she wants to go to a friend's wedding in Hong Kong and can't, probably. Um, but there have been implications and some quite sinister implications. So one of my colleagues who's been banned, there's some serious problems about her daughter going to university because she's applied to some universities where the Chinese uh, government have invested quite a lot of money. And we are in a very unhealthy position that there are some universities in this country that rely as much as 30% of their revenue from China. Uh, and they flex their muscles. That is not a healthy state to be in. We know about the problems of the Confucius Institutes and the influence that they, uh, that they wage. So um, I've been quite lucky in that, uh, in that respect. But I remember when I was a minister, I was a minister for children uh, back in the coalition government. And it was 2011, 2012, when the Dalai Lama came to the UK, and the then Speaker of the House of Commons, John Burke, was hosting a lunch for him, and various people had been invited, including me and Norman Baker, who was a Lib Dem MP, who was also a minister, and was president of the Tibet Society, and had been involved with Tibet even longer than, uh, than me. And we'd been invited to this dinner, and we were um, uh, planning to go to the dinner, and the Prime Minister, David Cameron, was in Mexico at the time on some visit. And we received a call from the Prime Minister's office in Mexico saying, um, you're not going to that lunch, so you can't meet the Dalai Lama. Um, that was disgraceful, because only a few years earlier, in opposition, the Dalai Lama met David Cameron in the House of Commons. And I remember helping to host the event, and I had to collect the Dalai Lama from David Cameron's office and take him to a meeting with other MPs, the other side of the Palace of Westminster, which was about a five minutes walk. It took 45 minutes to get there because His Holiness had to speak to everyone, <laughs> everyone. So the meeting was terribly late, but everybody loved him. You know, the cleaners, the security people, the police came up and wanted to shake his hand and have a, have a selfie um, um, with him. Um, so, it, it was a real problem for Norman Baker and I as to do we say, no, nope, we're going to see the Dalai uh, Lama and that's tough and probably get sacked, or should we say, all right then, and we'll carry on with our jobs. In the end, we decided not to go to the lunch. And the reason we didn't go to the lunch is we met the Dalai Lama the day before at the Albert Hall. So actually, we'd already done it, so it didn't, um, it didn't matter. Um, but the pressure that China was putting on Downing Street, the government, that they put on local authorities, on companies in the UK who dare to speak out against China or were hosting the Dalai Lama or doing anything with the Tibetan community or others who are critical of, um, uh, of, uh, of China is absolutely disgraceful. And for too many years, our government of all persuasions and other countries have kowtowed to the Chinese uh, and turned a blind eye um, to it. And that has stopped and absolutely should have stopped um, earlier because the only way you impress upon the Chinese is to stand up to them and call them out. And that has started to happen. And I hope that some of us who were there in the early days have emboldened others in positions of uh, authority to call out the Chinese because we now are beginning to realize the threat that they pose, not just to Tibetans, not just to other people inside China, but to the, to the security of the world um, at large as, uh, as well. And we are just waking up to, uh, to that. So if we've had some personal pressures and limitations we've had to take, actually it's been in a good cause ultimately. Uh, thank you, and it, it's important that you mention it. I'll come back to the university part, like the pressures on the university, because that's, of course we are in university, and like I'm well aware of what kind of pressures exist and not exist, and how, most universities give into it kind of stuff, but a couple of things you raised. One was Dalai Lama being very popular. I remember when he came here in 2012, uh, he came by a particular route and, and I was meeting him. And well, most people, well, many of you would not know him when I say not you non-Tibetan, he, he did. So the vice chancellor then wanted to meet him and he didn't care about the vice chancellor. He was meeting the security person, someone else, and he saw an old guy said, you look like me, come down. So the guy came down, met him, he took a lot of time, spent time on that. And that's something which people miss out on about the Dalai Lama, is the personal thing. So 
he's not well i say he's not articulate like let's say obama in terms of giving speeches he's not but the warmth he exudes and the way he engaged was i mean that's something which very few people can do today right now i remember david cameron thing because david cameron met and we had organized around that time without knowing what was happening in the background an event here on and it was titled i titled it, is the dalai lama bad for the west when we knew of pressures without even knowing you and others that this was happening is and we discuss how it's not bad for the west and people should stand up and one thing which you have to understand is china always give this idea that okay if you meet the dalai lama we are not going to send our government delegation which implies we'll move to france or we'll go to germany and they'll do the same there by the way that we'll go there and invest there and not in your country so we did some kind of i just followed the promise of 20 30 billion pounds of investment sounds big 20 30 billion if you're a member of parliament you'd want it in your constituency you i can bet you go and try to find out how much is it actually translates from mou into actual investment very little that's number one so this is a lot of it is a creation of an image and a lot of time change one change i noticed and that's the pressure how it works is how the language that we use starts changing according to what china wants and i've seen that in foreign office here i've seen that here with indian defense establishment which is supposedly critical and sees china as an enemy they'll talk of oh tibet is a sensitive matter okay sensitive for whom china oh we should be careful about the three t's tibet tiananmen and uh, whatever taiwan okay but why should we be careful who is saying it china oh tibet uh, china sovereignty over tibet again it's a chinese claim so what china has been very effective at is influencing through public diplomacy other means where even those who would be otherwise skeptical of china starts using the language of china yeah. so in my own work i call it the weaponization of sensitivity so you'd be expected to be sensitive to chinese people chinese students chinese scholars which in reality is never about this chinese is about the government so coming back to the university part i mean you which i'm not you, you said you know, people are waking up you know waking up to it they realize china is you know threat etc i'm not sure i share your confidence that we are waking up to it because yes i understand in political learn people see through it but in institution including universities do you find i mean what i find is that most people will give in to they'll not want to be upsetting chinese national sentiment so i'm just wondering where does your feeling that people are finally waking up to china threat coming from and how confident are you that it will be there okay that's a really good um, good challenge and i'm perhaps seeing it through the prism of um of members of parliament politicians around the the world so the fact that our parliament has voted to recognize the genocide in Xinjiang although the government hasn't adopted that as a policy yet but there's a lot of pressure on to do them to do that the fact that we did persuade the government to have a diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Winter um, Olympics the fact that we now have legislation which actually makes it virtually impossible for chinese companies to be part of nuclear power station contracts in this uh, country and has serious criteria for scrutiny for them getting involved in other infrastructure um projects bit Huawei and 5G and and so on um that wouldn't have happened 10 years ago so in our parliament and similar things have happened in other parliaments actually led by congress the americans have been really progressive on uh, uh, on on this and again it's a completely bipartisan you know there are colleagues who have been sanctioned from the republicans and from the democrats in uh, uh in in congress um there as uh, as well and some of the you know the 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 republicans have been really solid on uh, on this so from a political perspective absolutely we're waking up to it and we are always putting pressure on the government we've got a procurement bill going through parliament at the moment where we're trying to put down uh, amendments to make it much more difficult for uh chinese security camera companies or whatever to be able to uh have their stuff over uh, over here and we are pushing it at open door and most polit- most MPs agree with us in terms of companies businesses and ordinary um people yes i think there is a well we need that contract with china 
we need to expand and China offers the market that we want or we need to import this stuff from, from China, that is still a problem, although we've made it slightly more difficult. So British businesses who are investing in Xinjiang province now have to go through various checks and, and, and hurdles to, uh, uh, to do that. But then ultimately, I think we are beginning to see a change in ordinary people's attitudes as well. And I think that has been largely promoted by the pandemic. So people woke up to the fact that the pandemic started in China, that the, China, that the, the Chinese have got a lot to answer for, and the fact that they haven't allowed full transparency with WHO investigators and everybody else to how exactly it started uh, only makes more complicit their, their guilt here. But then the fact that they benefited hugely from the pandemic by having a monopoly on PPE virtually. And so people have woken up to the fact is, why are we were so reliant on China for buying stuff cheap, but even in an emergency when you needed stuff, we had to rely on China. That cannot be good. And I think what's happened since in Ukraine, where people have woken up to the whole issue of energy security. So is it good for our country, not so much us, but other European countries, to be so reliant on Russian gas or Russian um, oil? Actually, it's not, is it? And when the chips are down, it's got serious consequences. And I think people are more conscious of food security as well. We need to be growing more of our own food in this, uh, uh, this country because all of a sudden when Ukraine is at, is at war, they're the major grain suppliers to much of the, uh, of the world as, uh, as well. So I think that combination of events has woken ordinary people up who would never have heard of Tibet in many cases, may have just about heard of the Dalai Lama but don't really know who he is or what he, what he stands for, had never heard of Xinjiang, but now actually most people have heard of Xinjiang and um, those Uyghur people. Nobody can spell it still, but actually they've got, you know, in the psyche, the consciousness of what China has been responsible for has gone up hugely. And I think people are beginning to think twice before they just buy something that may be cheap and comes from China. Um, we've got a long way to go, and that's why what we'd like to see in legislation is that just as increasingly when we go and buy things in the shops, we want to know that they're environmentally friendly and they're sustainable, well, we also should be wanting to know that they haven't been produced by slave labor uh, from Uyghur concentration camps or whatever. So I want to have some sort of authentication mark on products coming out of China that they have been produced ethically uh, and that there's an inspection regime that can show that for sure, and so we can buy with, uh, with confidence. And I think that's where we need to go, and I think there'll be a deal of, uh, of, of public support for that. And in fact, I get it. So we do find that in general, I mean, US is an example, of course, but even UK context, increasingly there's across the cutting, across the party lines, there's a broad recognition of different threats that China poses and you know how to respond to it. So we can see that. Now, of course, but we're also dealing with the society broadly where there's a lot of skepticism of politicians. So now, when you have got all political parties broadly agreeing on something, but you also have got a generation of young people who are generally skeptical of politicians, so I'm, and maybe it's a different constituencies we deal with. So I deal generally with younger people, students, etc. And my own impression is that most of them don't know and don't care about China, broadly speaking, well, while politicians do. So what ideas, I mean, what should we do? I'm, I'm explaining together. I don't know what the answer is. Maybe we'll open it to you also. What can we do where, in that sense, the younger generation that's generally skeptical of politicians and politics also recognizes that what we're talking about when it comes to China or Tibetans or Uyghurs or human rights, etc., is not about politicians or political class. It is about something that affects them. So what else can we do? So in your constituency forms, do you get many people talking of it or is it largely that for them, it's irrelevant. Okay, so skepticism towards politicians, generally, and in this country, is nothing new. Okay. In 1834, the then Houses of Parliament caught fire and burnt down. And for two whole days, there was a raging fire on the north bank of, uh, of the Thames. And for all of those two days, there were big crowds on the south banks of the Thames, mostly cheering. So people's 
views on politics and politicians hasn't changed a lot in the last 180 years since Parliament burnt down and then was rebuilt. Um, and you're right, but it's not just young people who are skeptical and cynical towards politicians. Regularly in the which professions do you trust uh, opinion poll, which comes out every year from YouGov or whichever polling company does it, right at the top is usually doctors, polling about 84%, do you trust this profession? Then there'll be teachers are quite high up or they've been slipping. Clergy, although they've been slipping quite a bit actually, but they're usually sort of 60s and um, 70s. And they go all the way down and you get to, I think usually we score about 13% of members of parliament. But below, just below members of parliament, are opinion pollsters. So there is some justice in, uh, in that. The point is that it's nothing uh, that it's nothing um, new. But um, this isn't a political issue and it shouldn't be seen through the eyes of, uh, of politicians. This is an issue about what China is doing, not just to its own citizens within the borders, but actually is doing to the rest of the, the world. And that's whether it's trying to buy up votes in the Belt and Road um, project and holding countries to sort of debt ransom effectively. We see what's happening in Sri Lanka, in, uh, in Uganda, and other countries like, um, uh, like that. Um, and I think people do sit up and see what's gone on in Xinjiang and uh, the fact that we've now got millions of people in concentration camps, in the orange boiler suits or whatever. That can't be right, can it? However, even if you're not interested in Tibet, you're not interested in what China uh, is doing against the, the Uyghurs. You're not particularly into human rights. Most people, and particularly young people, are into the environment and climate change and what's happening to our, our planet. And there's a huge opportunity here because the biggest destroyers of our planet and the biggest contributors to climate change are the Chinese. So we are responsible in this country for just under 1% of greenhouse gases. China is responsible for 29%. In the last 11 years, China has burnt more coal than the rest of the world put together and is still building uh, coal-fired power stations at a rate of knots, whilst at the same time supposedly having a big renewable industry as well. The Tibetan Plateau, the third pole, is responsible for refreshing up to a third of the world's um, population. And at the current rate on climate change, over half of the glaciers on the Tibetan Plateau will have melted by 2050. This is big stuff, let alone the environmental damage they have done in Tibet itself, um, where they're only interested in pillaging it for rare earth minerals, for uranium, for other natural um, resources, the huge dam projects uh, that, they've, um, that they've put in, the slave labor effect that they've used for the, for the railways and everything like this. This has a big impact, not just for China, but for the whole of our planet. So we should be using the issue of climate change as an additional way of raising people's awareness, and particularly young people's awareness, of what the Chinese government is doing to its own people with its own um, borders. And if that doesn't get them interested in the subject, I don't know what will. And it's great, on my last visit to Durham Salah in the university in Durham Salah, they've got a really good climate change department doing some really good research so they can show the evidence for how the Tibetan Plateau glaciers are melting and the impact that's going to have on the Indo, uh, Indian subcontinent and the flooding in Bangladesh and, and others as the, uh, as the glaciers melt as, uh, as well. And we must use that. In fact, uh, my last visit to Tibet that was more than a decade ago, I recall, I mean, my f shock was somehow the pro-China, whatever they go, they get impressed by the roads and everything. But of course, when you go and you see the mountains being cut completely, and I had never seen that scale of destruction, which was being sold in the name of development. And that's what China has been doing, is always selling the idea of growth and development of a kind which is not based on empowering the people, 
Tibetans or Uyghurs or Hong Kong people or Chinese themselves, but very much about what Beijing decides what growth is. One final question for me before we open up for questions from the audience is about how do you or how do we, because you and we be together, is how do we respond to those who say, well, yes, what China does is bad, but look at US, what it did in Iraq. Look at UK, what does it X, Y, Z. Look at India, what it messes up in places. Or look at Turkey, what it does with Kurds. So the idea is when, and there are a lot of people who say it, right? Who are we to raise issues of human rights and values when we ourselves, wherever we are, are not, we shouldn't be holier than thou. And I've got that a lot, especially after Iraq war, by the way, that, okay, who are we talk of international law, occupation, human rights, when we ourselves are no better. So how do you respond to that? Or how do we respond? Okay, so nobody is without fault. And some things which Britain has done in the world in the past and distant uh, uh, past um, uh, is difficult to uh, defend. I also think we've done some very good things. And things that America has done more uh, recently um, deserve um, criticism and other countries as, um, uh, as well. Um, None of us are committing genocide now. So we can have debates about what happened in history and the values and the morals of that approach at the time. But whilst we sit in this room, the second largest economy in the world that is trying to become the largest economy in the world, that's trying to dominate technology uh, in, the, uh, in the world, which has a huge grip over international trade, China, controls something like 104 ports around the world, so its grip on infrastructure and how we move goods around the world in international trade is hugely powerful. That country has been found guilty of committing genocide against uh, the, uh, the Uyghurs, uh, and we know they've committed genocide against the uh, Tibetans, and before long, there could be a case for what they're doing in Hong Kong is certainly severe human rights abuses and complete flagrant breach of the international rule of, uh, of law. All that is happening um, now, uh, and we have to, we have to call that, uh, that out. That is not to defend what other countries have been up to, but I think it's on a whole new level. And the fact that they are by far the biggest polluters uh, of this planet at a time when we all need to pull together uh, to really fight against climate uh, uh, change, um, then, you know, we've got to view them differently. We cannot deal, we cannot trade, we cannot enter into agreements with China on the same basis as other Western countries all the time they are committing these atrocities against people within their borders and beyond their uh, borders as well. Yeah, and on that I'll just add is a lot of time, I mean, I recall people saying, oh no, surveillance, there's a lot of surveillance cameras, etc. in China, or oh, what about in Britain, London is the most surveilled city, etc. My only thing is you see camera and you can show middle finger and no one, well, you, as you know, no one is going to break your finger. Now imagine doing that in China with the government. And that's something a lot of people forget that with all the flaws in any kind of even democracy with all the flaws, with all the injustices, all the racisms, all the inequalities, hierarchies, there's still rule of law. And in case of China, the party is above the law. So for instance, there is law, but the People's Court is party's court. People's Liberation Army is party's army. And that's something which is hugely different in China vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. So that's quite different. So again, thank you so much. Now we have got time for questions, comments, but if it's comment, keep it brief, please. And question maybe, okay, who wants, I want one question, two question, three question. Do, and fourth, yeah, could you please send, you can stand up and yeah. Um, I just have a question related to how do you engage with the Tibetan government in exile and what relationship do you have with them? So, um, so next week, the Sikyong, the new Sikyong, is coming to London. He'll be spending all day Tuesday in Parliament. I'll be hosting meetings for him. He'll be meeting many other MPs. He'll be meeting the chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. He will be, um, although the Foreign Office don't know this yet, meeting a Foreign Office Minister. Um, and We'll be meeting the speaker and will be welcomed as uh, as well. And he is 
the representative of the Tibetan government in exile. When I go to Dharamsala, when other MPs go to Dharamsala, we usually time it to coincide with the sittings of the parliament in um, Dharamsala, and we deal with them on a parliamentarian to parliamentarian um, basis. As far as I'm concerned, they may be the Tibetan parliament in exile, but they are Tibetan MPs, and I deal with them on the same basis as American congressmen or French MPs or... Well, actually, I deal with the French MPs slightly differently, but that's another, that's another matter. Um, so, yes, and I'm really pleased when the Sikyong, the previous Sikyong, came to Parliament a couple of times before, and the then Speaker, John Burko, for all his faults, and crikey, he did have a lot of faults, one of his strengths was he was very supportive of Tibet. Uh, and he was very keen to welcome the Sikyong to Parliament. Um, and he met him, and not only did he meet him, but when the Sikyong was actually in the public gallery in the chamber, from the chair, the speaker welcomed the, uh, the Sikyong as the representative of the Tibetan parliament in, uh, in exile. That was a, quite a big thing to do. The Chinese were furious. Great result. So I think we've gone out of our way to say the Tibetan people are represented by a Tibetan parliament, a slightly unconventional one, that's made up from people from all around the world who come together in Durham and Lyra every so often um, to do their deliberations, and we want them to be to be recognised in the uh, in the same way as other legitimate parliaments who have the luxury of being able to be sitting in parliament in their own country. Yeah, and this is where I mean, think of India, right? India is where most Tibetan exiles live, and how many times do we see Tibetan? Forget, forget Indian ministers, but Indian politicians actually being reaching out to Tibet. They hardly do that. So there's a big difference between that and here. But one thing I also point out to others is, while Chinese, of course, do not recognize the parliament in exile, government in exile, but they treat it as a government in exile. So I recall in the past, I mean, this is years ago when Si Kiong is a political leader, right? So imagine prime minister slash president, government in exile. The before the current one, there was another one for two terms, and before that, this is before the elections took place, and before the Dalai Lama, we knew that Dalai Lama was going to give up on his political position and become simply a religious slash, you know, uh, as a religious leader, and there'll be a political leader. I remember being in China then, and every at every university, every think tank, closed door meetings, the question that would be asked is about, what do you think will happen? And they use the word democracy in exile. And they would say, so have you met the for you know, the incoming whatever I said, yes, I've met them, I've met all of them, I've hosted them at university, what do you think? So I noticed that they were paying more attention to democracy in exile than no one, anyone else was. So we had, I had Tibetan friends who were a bit skeptical, questioning, but the Chinese government and Chinese scholars are paying serious attention. Because in that sense, they do recognize that there's very little legitimacy that they themselves have. And democracy in exile has legitimacy, and people vote on it. It's a very interesting country. Those of you who are not related to it, please do check out. And that's an example for many parts of the world, how to function as a democracy in exile, and also have to have, you know, para-diplomacy, etc. So that's it. Thank you. We had a question there. Who, yeah, could, could you, I don't know, I'm sorry, I'm making you do the hard work, though you're a guest, so. Thank you. Um, first, I would just like to... Uh, offer sincere thanks to both of you for what you have done in the past for democracy and for Tibet, what you are doing, and no doubt what you will do in the future. And I would just ask all of us to show our appreciation. I think most of us would agree that um, given the Chinese Communist Party's track record and what it stands for. Trying to stop the spread of its poison to the rest of the world is as much of a challenge for the globe in this century as is climate change. Central to that is to decouple the very, very unhealthy dependence that a lot of the world have on, uh, on China, because it makes us vulnerable, particularly when uh, in the next five years, certainly within the next 10 years, Taiwan is going to be invaded. <clears throat> um, very quickly, China controls 
90% of the world's supply of antibiotics. China makes 90% of the world's computers. China controls 80 to 90% of the rare earths, which are the future of uh, our technological world. And if we don't decouple, and decouple quickly, China, the Chinese Communist Party have got a knife to our throat. So the question is, that I would like to ask, is what can we do, as either as activists or would-be activists, to help people like yourselves uh, to reduce the very unhealthy dependence on China and within a fairly short time scale? Well, that, you're very kind. Thank you for your, your, your words. Um, we all have a responsibility here. So politicians have their hands strengthened when they have a lot of constituents behind them. So it helps me greatly when I can say that a lot of my constituents have written to me or lobbied me concerned about the power of China, um, even if they don't necessarily link it to Tibet. And I, uh, I think I have one Tibetan in my um, constituency that I'm, uh, that I'm aware of. Um, and we need people to wake up to this and to say to their politicians, I'm really worried about this and the way things are going with China. I mean, they're looking to have technological control of the, uh, of the world. I did a, I was on BBC Politics show earlier, and we were talking about AI. And I, mean, I don't particularly understand AI, but I, I know that I need to, because by 2030, it's predicted that AI will account for 5% of GDP in this country and employ an awful lot of people. We are third in the world in AI. Number one is America, followed by China. Uh, and China uh, is using AI as a way of expressing its, its power and using it for its power and dominance across the, across the world. China is very smart. China plays a long game. So what's going on in the Ukraine at the moment? Russia are complete amateurs compared to China. And China is playing a long waiting um, game and what will happen in Ukraine is very important for China. I think they've, they've woken up to the fact that NATO and the West did rally round uh, in opposition to the, uh, to the Russians. Putin miscalculated. He thought that after Afghanistan, the NATO was a weakened um, force. It's made NATO stronger. It's also made it, um, made it bigger. So the Chinese are looking very closely at what happens in uh, Ukraine as to what their next move should be on Taiwan. And everything that Xi has said in his 10 years as president, and he'll be a life dictator. I mean, he's becoming very much like the old Soviet uh, bloc uh, lifetime um, dictators. He's been um, uh, elected is the wrong word, but he's become president for the third uh, time as a, as a president in the... Uh, in, in that. And it is his ambition to reunite Taiwan with the, um, with the motherland. The question is, do they think they can get away with it? So that's why it's really important that the West says that we will stand up for Taiwan. We've stood up for Ukraine and hopefully, although goodness knows when, we will have a satisfactory conclusion in um, Ukraine, and again, the inspiration of the Ukrainian people and what they've um, uh, achieved, um, we need to stand shoulder to shoulder with Taiwan, because if those countries go, then that has huge impacts on the rule of law and other lesser countries being at the whim of those super superpowers. So we just need to make it clear that ordinary people share those concerns as well. But the reason China is in such a powerful position is we all buy their stuff. And have been buying their stuff for years and years because it's cheap. It's also not very good quality in many cases, but we've sacrificed that because actually it's cheap. We just need to encourage everybody to read the label before you buy. Because if we stop buying the stuff that China churns out, and the pandemic and PPE, I think, was a really good case in point of look at the origin of all this, uh, this stuff, then China's economy suffers. And it's only their economic might 
that has enabled them to do what they've done. It's certainly not their moral might. Um, so people need to vote with their, with their pockets as, uh, as, as well. And if it means paying a bit more, but actually thwarting China's military ambitions, thwarting China being the biggest polluters on the, uh, on the earth, thwarting their human rights abuses in Xinjiang, in Tibet, in, in Hong Kong or whatever, then actually surely that's a much bigger and better prize that we should be uh, aiming for. That's a hard sell to many of my constituents who don't know where Xinjiang or Tibet uh, is or whatever, but it's up to all of us to educate and say that China is, as the head of the National Cyber Security uh, uh, Unit this week has said, is the biggest threat to the world's security. And if I could add to that, I mean, in terms of a few things, we have noticed most people are not very engaged politically most of the time. Occasionally they are. And I can sense that, you know, where, where they pointed lobbying, that all you need is, and this is why, speak up, speak out. That's very important. In any case, most people are never mobilized, so it's okay. Even if few people do it, they write letters, they reach out to the members of parliament, they reach out to government. But that makes a difference. That makes more easy difference for those who are already committed, for those who might not actually be committed, but they still want to say something, but they don't want to lose the election. So that's important. Mobil I would say political mobilization. Let's just call it that. That's number one. So the protests that Tibetans do, that also matters. I know you might think it's not that huge. It's not like huge protest. Does not matter. It is visible. Visibility matters. Now something which you have to bear in mind with Taiwan, which China has been doing in Hong Kong. So we know of the Hong Kong people who are put in prison. But there are many Hong Kong people who are comfortable with China. And in that sense, that's a longer term game which China has been playing is use economic for political gains. So encourage certain kind of wealth, make billionaires depend on you, not all, but most billionaires will depend on you. And it's an odd position where the Communist Party's biggest, dependers, uh, de biggest, biggest defenders are the rich. Normally you'd expect the working classes to be pro-Communist Party and the rich to be against Communist Party. But in case of Hong Kong and also in case of Taiwan, if you look at the class difference between people who broadly support KMT and therefore they'd be okay with not reunification but some kind of accommodation with China mm -hmm. are the ones who are relatively rich. So And China has been using that. So the idea that, look, you want your economic welfare, you have invested now in Shanghai and other places, you better be quiet. Don't be pro-China but don't be anti-China. So that's a longer term and I would say we can blame China for all of it, but we have to blame ourselves, blame our own companies, blame our own short-term thinking. So that's a longer-term thing one could do. I was thinking of Hollywood, right? Uh, Hollywood has all kinds of problems. Seven years in Tibet, again, for young people you'd not know, seven years in a Brad Pitt was the actor. You know, if you have a hot spot, Brad Pitt, which I had, which I have, Brad Pitt, you know, it's there. Now, can you imagine seven years of Tibet kind of broadly pro-Tibetan movie being made in Hollywood today, with a big actor playing a role. Angelina Jolie or Brad Pitt or whoever the new actors, I don't know, but you know, they're there. You don't. Think about why. So in 90s, late 90s, when it was in trend, a lot of Hollywood people were pro-Tibet. China was not a big market. Today, if you look at the, who's the enemy, and you know, scholars look at it, and I also look at who's the enemy in Hollywood movies. In very racist terms, it will be the Muslims and the Arabs and then the whatever, and then the British. A very, okay, very suave British would be ultimate be the enemies, right? Because that's easy to target them. Russians are very common enemies, by the way, which tells you that Russia is not a big market for Hollywood because Russians will be common enemy. You'd almost never find the main enemy to be Chinese. I'm not saying it should be. I'm not saying do it. But how come Russians, sorry, how come Chinese and Indians are never the enemies? That's because of the market part. And so just pay attention to those things, the ways in which not only what China does, but what our view of China is and where the market goes influences the ways in which you engage. Which is sadly realized that earlier, of course, some Hollywood actors and you know singers, they would be sanctioned by China because of they would say free Tibet and then they get sanctioned. Now hardly anyone says free Tibet. And for me, that's a more dangerous phenomenon where without Chinese government doing anything, a lot of us are self-censoring because it's against our economic interests individually or where the 
the studios we are part of, the companies we are part of, institutions we are part of, will say, look, let's just keep quiet. It's not worth it. That's a, a big thing, right? So I do think we have to also look at our own hypocrisy and our own position in what we are doing. So that's a broader struggle. Okay, that was not addressed at me, but I just wanted to add to that. Uh, we do, we do have said, Richard oh, Gere, of course. Yes, hey, Richard Gere, and he remains steadfast, and that's I, all. I, I want to meet him. I've, I've met many, but I've not to meet him, but very few. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you. I'll, I'll follow Nick to say that uh, a big thank you to uh, Dibesh and uh, Tim for this very important and timely discussion on Tibet. Uh, um, uh, my, I have like two questions and a request. Uh, the first question would be about, uh, we all know that the UK government's uh, relationship with China, the golden era is no more now and we know that uh, uh, recently, the current government uh, did a, a refresh of the integrated review where they looked at China, and uh, the current government has defined the relationship as robust pragmatism. So I would really appreciate if Tim can shed a little bit of light on that. And the other thing would be uh, about uh, the, the young students over here at this university. I'm, I'm also a student here apparently, and my classmates are here with me, and our instructor, Dr. Anderson, is also here. So it would be really uh, useful if, uh, uh, Tim, you, given your ex experience uh, in advocating for a very difficult topic like Tibet, how can the students over here, especially those who are uh, in the global politics and international relations, how they can help uh, raise the Tibet. Uh, in our case, I can say here that my classmates have been really very supportive and we are trying to start a Tibet society here at this university and hopefully in the next one week we'll get the, the information that that is set up. So we are really looking forward to that and I'm really thankful to my classmates for helping me in this. And so uh, those are my two questions and my one request is uh, in the coming semester, it would be really good if uh, uh, our, our class, you know, the entire class can come over there to the parliament and if you can host us for a visit there. Thank you so much. Sure. And thank you for inviting me. And, um, of course, always happy to, to host people at, um, at parliament. So, um, robust pragmatism. What on earth does that mean? So there were a few of us who raised our eyebrows when... Um, at the Prime Minister came up with that phrase and I actually challenged him and I had a, um, several of us being sanctioned were invited to go and see him just before Christmas and we had a, actually a really good discussion um, and I, I have a good deal of time for Rishi um, uh, Sunak I think he's, he's, he's smart um, and I think he's getting things um, done and he's a lot better than what went before but it's a low bar but anyway we won't get into that um, but the problem is largely with the Foreign Office so the front of today's Guardian has got a headline from James Cleverley, the Foreign Secretary, saying we shouldn't pull down the shutters on, um, on China. Well, even those of us who are sanctioned are not saying we should pull down on the shutters on China. We can't ignore China. We can't say we're not going to talk to you any, uh, anymore. We've got to engage with them. But we've got to engage uh, with them on the basis of challenge and constructive criticism and... If you want to be treated like any other normal international law-abiding country on the planet, you've got to change your, uh, your ways. So when President Macron goes to China, as he did last week, with a huge fleet of businessmen and women, with the sole objective of signing up lots of contracts for... Chinese investment in French nuclear power stations and everything else, and saying, actually, we shouldn't get too hung up with, um, with America and their attitude to Taiwan, that is really, really unhelpful. Um, now, I hope, and we've been emboldening ministers to be more challenging in our relationship with, um, uh, with China. So, sure, we want to do business with China. They are the second largest economy uh, in the world but we want to do legitimate business with, uh, with China, and we hope we can influence their ways by saying we're an important customer of yours, but we're not going to buy your stuff if it's going to be as a result of human rights um, abuses, if it's as a result of you trying to buy influence in African countries because you're pillaging their lithium mines or whatever that's going on. 
but we also need to have an alternative to the Belt and Road. I thought it was slightly ironic that David Cameron wrote an article in the uh, Sunday papers uh, saying that um, we need to have a constructive relationship with uh, China, but we need to have an alternative to the Belt and Road, when he was the inventor of the golden era, him and George um, Osborne, and were fating President Xi when he came over to London all those years ago. That was unhelpful, because they were turning a blind eye to what was going on. And the problem, I'm afraid, is the Foreign Office in this country. There's an old joke that says somebody is wandering down Whitehall um, and goes up to a policeman and asks him, um, uh, excuse me, officer, which side is the Foreign Office on? To which the reply is, well, hopefully ours, sir. Um, and I'm afraid that still occasionally reigns, rings true because the default position of the Foreign Office is they see everybody as an investment opportunity and we want to have good relations with everybody. Um, but you can't have normal relations with China when China is doing the sort of stuff it's doing and human rights abuses on an industrial scale and is cyber attacking our businesses and our, uh, our computer um, systems, is, in, is developing space technology which uh, is a whole new um, uh, age of, uh, of, of galactic um, uh, warfare, is controlling the ports, is busting uh, countries, is spying on our, uh, through its equipment, on our army bases and everything else as, as well. Um, you've, you've got to ask them some serious questions before you sign on the, uh, on the, dotted, um, on the dotted line. So we need to be robust callers out of China. And if you want to do business with us, then you've got to improve your ways. And as I say, ultimately, money talks with China because that's why they got their power, because we've been giving them money to buy their stuff. And the more we become independent, we're going to become more energy independent, we're going to become more food secure, and we're going to be producing more of the stuff in the West. Because their stranglehold over the semiconductor market is potentially huge. So much of the equipment that we buy contain semiconductors made by China or Taiwan. And so, hence, the agenda for Taiwan is also about absolutely controlling the world semiconductor market as, uh, as, as well. And their control of the ports, you know, no longer do you need to blockade a port. You can, if there's some sensitive defense equipment that is going across the world to America or to the UK or whatever, um, because of the way technology works, in ports, you can just isolate certain shipments and all of a sudden America or the UK defense industry has got a problem because it's not getting that shipment because these ports are now being controlled by, uh, by China. They are really smart and we just got to keep, um, keep calling, them, calling them out as, I've, as I said all, uh, uh, all along. And the more ordinary people can do that and say to their MPs, yeah, we don't like what's going on in China. You need to stand up um, for us. And we're going to actively be far more um, uh, scrutinous before we buy Chinese goods as, uh, as well. I think that's what's uh, important. And I've, I've um, gone on for far too long and I've forgotten your second question. No, students. Uh, and students, yes. Yeah. So, okay, so we've got... We have a lot of students, Chinese students, in this, uh, in this country. They are the largest non-EU... Uh, group of students in this uh, in this country, um, and I welcome that. I mean, our, our argument is not with the people of China. Our argument is with the Chinese Communist um, government. The trouble is, quite a lot of those students are acting as agents of the Chinese Communist government, are being funded by the Chinese Communist government as well. So when Chinese students happened in my old university, the first university who was Warwick University, there was a debate in the student union um, last year about calling out China on human rights. And a lot of Chinese students turned up, spoke against it, and voted it down. Um, now, that wasn't because, you know, anything to do with free speech. That was because they were under pressure from the, the Chinese government to, uh, to do that. Tibetans and Uyghurs and others over here who know what China is really like need to stand up, speak up, and challenge those Chinese students if they are doing the will of the Chinese Communist government.
we've got lots of really good Chinese students in this country. There's lots of scientific brains there. I, I would love them to stay in the UK and contribute to UK technology and UK PLC. But they've got to make a choice. Are they doing the will of China or they actually they want to expand their horizons and contribute their skills uh, to the West? If I could add to that, I mean, in terms of uh, my own experience, again, as you pointed out, the challenge we are discussing is not Chinese people, Chinese students, Chinese scholars, but very much about Chinese government. And in which case, even the Chinese people themselves are the victims of that government, but they have very little say. So what I found was, in let's say, in classes where I had more than one Chinese student, one to one, they would talk of various things, right? And they were not anti-China, but they were critical of the government, they'll talk of human rights, they'll talk of corruption, that was a common thing. But the moment they would be in the class with other Chinese students, they'll go quiet. And one of them who was very critical in person would say, look, because I don't trust the other Chinese students. So the sad reality was, right or wrong, a lot of them were self-censoring because they did not trust other students from China. That's one, right? Now, that's a broad experience of mine with the V Chinese. And okay, they'll do a lot of interesting work, research work, including Tibet, other things, but we'll keep it quiet. So we do need to use education to open up. What universities need to not do is, and I'll give example is, a lot of time I've noticed in university sector in the UK, we self-censor ourselves because assuming that Chinese rule will, will upset. My question is, if we are promoting an education that's open-minded, critical, etc., that can be pro-China, anti-China, doesn't matter, you're open-minded, you can't self-censor because you've got many Chinese students. So, and I can tell you with confidence, I've noticed in many universities, not ours, thankfully, because anyway, I'm here and I also watch and we have generally decent colleagues, right, is many academics self-censor themselves because they have Confucius Institute. So it's not that Confucius Institute is telling them to shut down or keep quiet. It's they themselves start self-censoring, partly because they need access to China, but partly because also think they don't want to upset. So that's something we have to be very careful about. 2008, when there was a large-scale protest in Tibet, many of you would uh, you'd be born then, but you were young people, right? 2008, I remember a discussion at our university on uh, protests in China. There were students from China, but almost using tears, and I'm using tears, weaponizing tears about how upset they were because of CNN and BBC coverage. And that was being moderated by white Western scholars who did not push back. And I remember asking them, okay, fine, it's wrong that BBC and CNN are biased. Is Global Times or, you know, People's Daily, are they not biased? Do you want views here which are multi faceted but do you also work in China to opt for that? And of course, they didn't. So I would say that, yes, you can, I could excuse Chinese students for being not only nationalists, but also silent because of the oppression they suffer. But what I can't excuse is, in this case, I'll say Western scholars being such big sellouts and self-censoring. That's an important part to bear in mind, right? Because it is our duty to promote education. And I would say one thing is, during pandemic time, when students were in different countries, there was a discussion that how do we teach sensitive matters to students now that they are in places? Okay, should we not teach Uyghurs, not teach about Hong Kong, because of course they're at risk, which I understand to an extent. And, I would, uh, and the, for me, the question was, do we not talk of LGBTQ rights? Because the, half of the students are in countries which are not recognizing LGBTQ, and of course no one will accept it. I said, then why should we accept China? The only thing we should not do is force students based in China to study something that might put them at risk. So I do think there are ways out. It's about educating ourselves, working with each other, and ultimately, and one final thing, I mean, we're well, not fine, foreign office, which you mentioned. I'll not say foreign office, some office. I remember in 2008, you'd remember there was a, when David Miliband was there. And there, were, there was a policy shift of the UK on Shimla conference, and it was done via website, something. And I remember having conversation about why, okay, basically, technically, UK said it's aligning its policy with other European and Western countries and recognizing Chinese sovereignty, etc. And I said, why? What was the pressure to do it? And what I was told was, the sense they had was, if they do it, then they'll have more fruitful negotiation with China on climate change. True or false, I don't know, but I won't be surprised if they actually believed in it. Yeah. And since then, I don't believe there was any negotiation on human rights and uh, uh, whatever. So as you pointed out, Tim said, China does, Chinese government does play a very long-term game. 
and democracies that depend on elections every five years often aren't good at it. But that doesn't mean they're not, they can't be good at it because ultimately what democracies have, and not only West, by the way, democracies have is still change our government doesn't lead to collapse of the system. And China knows that any change of government means essentially collapse of not only the system, but collapse of the country. Because there is no China without People's Republic of China in this context, and People's Republic of China is essentially part of the Republic of China. Okay. One final, we have one question. Anyone else? You have a, oh, and two, okay. We'll take three questions and then the last. You've got one, two, and then three, yeah. Sorry. Uh, again, I just want to thank you both for organizing this event. So um, this is what I have to say. In terms of all definitions, historical and contemporary, China has and is committing genocide in Tibet. Um, David Lamy, the Shadow Secretary of State for Foreign, Commonwealth, and Development Affairs, has stated that Labour aimed to recognize the treatment of Uyghurs as genocide if they win the next election. Now, me as a Tibetan, I do wonder, is the conservative government willing to recognize Tibet as an occupied nation? If not, are they also willing to recognize what's happening in Tibet as a genocide, whether it be cultural as well? Oh, we can take it all together. Yeah, take it all together, yeah. Uh, sorry, yes, sorry. yes, him there. And Thank you both for your amazing uh, interaction and uh, for your support all these years for Tibet and other <clears throat> minority issues across China. I have a few questions, but I'm not going to go. I'm just going to stick to one question, which is uh, a few years ago, uh, Tim, you introduced a reciprocal access bill in the parliament. Could you please shed some light on this and what could we do to ensure that this does come into a proper bill? Thank you. Thank you. And one final question there. Thank you very much. Um, well, superpowers or emerging superpowers are usually very egoistic and uh, uh, very stubborn in their policies. In your observation, how difficult it is to communicate, engage, or even convince them on matters? Thank you. Thank you. Golly, well, that's a subject for a whole evening's seminar on its, um, uh, on its own. Um, but superpowers don't always remain superpowers, and you only have to look at what's happened to the Soviet Union to appreciate that. And what's happening in Ukraine at the moment is Putin's rather doomed to failure attempt to resurrect the Soviet Empire superpower. Um, but there was a big difference between the Soviet Union and China, in that the Soviet Union was bust. China's got lots of money. Um, and so what is going to influence China is any impact on its remaining one of the richest nations in the, in the world. And that starts with all of us as consumers and buyers of their, uh, of their goods. But, and I think m most people are not trying to demonize China most people want to see China as a fully contributing member of the international community, keen to do its bit on climate change, keen to do its bit on stabilizing international um, trade, and keen to do its bit for poverty alleviation within its own population and emerging middle classes or whatever. I and mean, that's what I think all of us want to, want to see. I just don't understand China's logic, and particularly on Tibet. Tibet, in the great scheme of things, however we may love Tibet and the Tibetan people, is not terribly important. The six million Tibetans who were living in, in China are a very small part of that population, and the Tibetan region is not essential in terms of commodities and things like that. It's certainly got a lot of natural resources which China is now trying to, uh, to, to pillage. Um, and there is an environmental impact with the Tibetan plateau, as I, as I say. So why was it so important for China to suppress the human rights of Tibetans, to snuff out their culture, their religion, their language, and try and Sinoize uh, the population of China and by flooding in Han Chinese so that Tibetans are a minority population in their own area now. I just don't understand it. For all the 
the negative coverage and grief it's caused them internationally, why are they so anti the Dalai Lama? Particularly since the Dalai Lama divested himself of his political uh, role 10 plus years um, ago, the Tibetan people and the Dalai Lama pose no threat to the Chinese Communist Party government. The constitution uh, of China respects and recognizes the, I always get it wrong, is it 57, 56 different indigenous communities, 56, uh, who live within Chinese um, boundaries. So within their own constitution, they should be allowing the Tibetans to follow their own religion and their culture and their education and everything as, as well. They've created such trouble for themselves by deciding they want to oppress the Chinese, the, the Tibetans and the Dalai Lama, and they're doing the same in Xinjiang. Again, Xinjiang is not hugely important in the great scheme of, uh, scheme of things. So we're dealing with an illogical regime uh, in China. Um, and if they were tomorrow to say, actually, you know what, we recognize the Dalai Lama as a spiritual um, uh, figurehead. He's welcome to come back to uh, Tibet. People are welcome to go and worship in Buddhist temples again. They're welcome to pursue the Tibetan language. What's the downside in that for the Chinese? I, frankly, there isn't any. So I just don't understand the logic of it. So how do you get China back on the straight and narrow when they've done a crazy thing the impact of which is huge compared to the impact of what it's having in China it's, uh, it, itself. So that's not an answer to your question, but it's a question to your question because I don't understand how we got here. Um, the, my bill. So I produced this bill called the Tibet Reciprocal Access Bill, which is entirely based on an American bill which went through Congress which basically says that if you don't allow access to Tibet by uh, politicians, by diplomats, by um, journalists, then Chinese officials won't have access to, in that case, America. So I just replicated what the Americans have, uh, have done, and then I've changed it, so it also now includes Xinjiang as, as well on the same principle. Now, it's a private member's bill, so it's not gonna get um, anywhere, but it's on the, uh, on the order paper, which annoys the Chinese, so there's a piece of legislation there which, if it were one day um, passed, um, would have an impact on the movement of Chinese officials. We've actually done some much more important uh, uh, things in that we've banned the Chinese ambassador coming to Parliament. Gosh, he's furious about that. And, um, you know, we said, well, hold on. China has sanctioned five members of Parliament for doing their job and standing up, democratically elected, democratically accountable, into the cradle of democracy in the British House of Commons and saying China's up to some, some dodgy stuff. That's what we, we do, for which we've been sanctioned. So you cannot expect to have access to the mother of parliaments by Chinese officials, the representative of the Chinese government in, uh, in the UK, the Chinese uh, uh, ambassador, whilst we are sanctioned for just doing our job and speaking up and telling the, telling the truth. Uh, it's been very hard for the Chinese to, um, to accept. But we will continue with legislation like this. We got a vote unanimously passed for a diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Olympics. That was a big loss of face to the Chinese. That didn't go down well with the Chinese. Uh, and Parliament has recognized uh, the genocide that's been going on in uh, Xinjiang. Many other parliaments have done um, the same. So to come back to the original um, question, and th this is... This mustn't be a party political um, matter. Now, I'm frustrated that my government has not said, OK, we recognize Parliament uh, has voted to recognize the genocide and that we will adopt it as um, government policy, as they have in some other countries, including um, America. I had many conversations with Boris Johnson uh, about this and with Liz Truss when she was Foreign Secretary, who was actually very supportive. And the problem we have is that in this country, genocide can only be acknowledged if it's been deemed as such by an international court. And the trouble is the international courts are a bit too beholden to the Chinese, so they've not recognized genocide. So it's a bit of a catch-22 situation. 
And the thing we haven't spoken about is that the Chinese are very good at buying influence in international institutions, be it the United Nations, be it the WHO, uh, and be it the International Court, and, uh, and so on. So we would need to change our procedures in order for the government then to recognize that genocide. And I think we could do that, and we'd like the government to do that. So in other parliaments, in France or, or other European parliaments, a vote of parliament would recognize officially genocide. In the United States, it only takes a fiat of the executive fiat of the president to recognize a genocide. So the problem is that our system doesn't recognize a genocide unless it's been shown in the international courts. So we need to change our system. I don't think an incoming Labour government would do that. So um, I don't think it's a, um, and also I think they might be a bit shy about offending China as one of the opening things that they do. So I recognize David Lemmy has said that. I don't think it would happen, frankly. And we shouldn't make this into part of political matter. We should all be working together to get the government of the day to change the system so that a vote of parliament, and the vast majority of people in parliament think the same way as I do, that the genocide has been committed. We need to recognize that. It needs to be official um, UK policy enforced by the government with all the implications it has for how we deal with China in the, uh, in, in, in the future. So it's frustrating we are where we are, but I understand why we are where we are, but hopefully we can get to a place where we can be in the same basis as other parliaments and, um, uh, and governments around the world. Yeah, just to add to that, again, in terms of, uh, you mentioned Soviet Union's collapse, impact, etc. we have to bear in mind that Soviet economy and the Western economy were not interlinked. So collapse of Soviet Union did not have any detrimental impact. The, so even if you imagine collapse of PRC, it will have a detrimental impact. Potentially, that's what the argument is. Now, what a lot of people don't recognize is, yes, we are dependent on China, which we are dependent on China, but China is also dependent. So it's not that... Let's say UK is dependent on China, US is dependent on China, India is dependent on China, but China is also dependent on each of these countries. And this is where this, I know it sounds very lame, but standing up to bullies, those of us, I was bullied as a kid. I remember the only way out I could recognize is by you stand up. And this is with we China, where if you look, notice, US institutions, including universities, are generally not bothered about what Chinese government says, and Chinese students still go there. When you look at UK, you notice it's quite different. So I'm going to bear that in mind. And it's good. I thought, where are our differences? Because we should have differences also. When you said, you don't get why China is so, I don't want to use the impolite word, but let's say so concerned about Tibet. It's a small matter for them. They should be able to accommodate. Again, for that, you have to go back to my old lectures, why for China it matters. It is about territory resources, but it's not only that, as you know, said. It is about the modern conception of Chinese nationalism that precedes PRC, by the way, that starts with Sun Yat-sen, who talked about five fingers of Chinese nation, Han, Hui, Manchu, Mongol, and Tin, without asking any of them. So it's connected to Chinese nationalism. So PRC, per se, is not the only problem. It is to do with modern Chinese nationalism. And ultimately, and where it agrees, it is about legitimacy of the Communist Party now. Given that they've sold to their own people that they liberated Tibetans endlessly, and that's the language they use, by the way. They say, we have liberated Tibetans. For them to acknowledge that there have been mistakes and get Dalai Lama back, which is commonsensical, it helps China, but it will question the legitimacy. And that's why they will not allow it, and they don't allow it. That's how I see it. In terms of a couple of more points, and we'll end it here. You know, recently there was a case of, in Pakistan of a blasphemy accusation against a Chinese uh, worker, right? For those of a couple of you might be from Pakistan, worker. I noticed how Chinese government is responding, given China has an upper hand vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan. If it was an American government, they would say, we will provide counselor service, this is unacceptable, defend our citizen. The Chinese government position has been simply, no reporting in China, by the way. Position is, we expect all our workers who go abroad to respect the local constitution and local laws, which is basically had, had, there would have been lynching of the person by the mob. They would have accepted it. And this is a big difference between Chinese government and most governments in the world, which is where in most governments they'll defend their own citizens. I don't think Chinese government will de defend its own citizen and they would sacrifice them very easily. So I just wanted to point that out. So sadly, that's not an advantage. 
But for Chinese system, there's that flexibility. They can give up their own people. They can let people die because ultimately it's an authoritarian system we're dealing with. And with of Tibet, of course, we know we are dealing with a colonial power. And I've used that col colonization. For those of us who do believe in decolonization, anti-colonial thought, etc., we do need to acknowledge coloniality and challenge it. That's the important part. What, and I would want to conclude with that and thank you for this. You're right. A lot of your fellow MPs recognize what's taking place. And you said, let's say the certain person saying, we will recognize it. Let's wait. If they come to government, what will they actually do? Because people change when they come to government in position of power. A lot of your fellow MPs are doing it. But those of us who observe politics, and I'm a professor of politics international, we also know how inconsistent that is. There are very few who remain consistent with all the costs attached. You have been one of them. And I have to say that, and I want to end with that, again, regardless of party, et cetera, because I have very little interest in your party, but you know. <laughs> that, that, I mean, no. And, yeah, no, no, but it's okay. It doesn't matter because what we have to acknowledge is principles matter. And Tibet issue, issues of Uyghurs, because you could have only talked of Tibet. You also talk of Uyghur Muslims. That's a very different kind of issue that they connect. You also talk of China, human rights. So we do need to acknowledge and remember that where we have got let's say politicians who have been consistent in the principle on human rights and on recognizing authoritarianism, we need to acknowledge it and we need to be, I'm not saying thankful because that's not, that's your duty. We don't need to be thankful to you for that, but we need to do everything possible that they're more like you. So on that note, let me thank you again for taking your time out. And thank uh, Theo and Leon there for recording. It's being recorded. Thank you. Uh, by the way, she's not helping out, but she just helped out. So volunteering Amina here and thanks everyone. That's it. So. And one final point, though we have another event on China Human Rights Tibet that's exactly a week later in this room. You'll get the notification. We have got Sikyong, again, for those of you who don't know, Tibetan context, Tibetan political leader coming to the UK. He's in parliament on Tuesday, we believe. He's here on Wednesday evening. There's a rare opportunity for you to interact with him, ask him any questions you want, and also show your support. Thank you again, and thanks, Tim.